and I'm really happy to be okay. with Paula Park today. She, she has been one of the persons that has influenced my floral design um, the most since I began 23 years ago. She was already doing beautiful work and it's an honor for me to be presenting her to you guys, to everyone. A lot of you are just starting. Some of you have been in the floral industry for a longer while. And right now what we, we're trying to do is unite forces via United Floral Industry. And learning from people that have already been here before us, it's a great opportunity. And well, Paula Pryke is a great human being. I just love meeting her. Hi, Paula. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you very much, Anna. Yes, so um, like I was telling you guys, um, this is supposed to be fun. We're supposed to enjoy, take advantage that you can learn from one of the best, have all your questions ready so you can ask her whatever you want, because <laughs> this is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start. I'm going to be showing you a video of the first interview I did with Paula. I would like if you could take us like on shortly, like how you started and like on a trip on your transition okay. being a florist. Okay. Well, um, I originally um, um, left school without thinking I was particularly artistic. And so I actually liked history, ended up doing, I was a history graduate, ended up being a history teacher. And um, so I started doing that. <laughs> Three years I realized that it wasn't really my thing I mean I like teaching in lots of ways but um, you know one autumn I remember thinking you know I'd rather be out there <laughs> and, it was Tuesday. and so um, I decided in the summer of, of the, the holiday the great thing about teaching is you do get good chunks of holiday isn't it that I would go to um, Constance Spry a flower school um, so that was still, I mean, Constance Spry actually died in 1960, but um, the school was still then run in her house that she used to live in and by people who had worked with her. So it very much felt, um, you know, it was very much almost of another time, really, almost. It was um, quite old fashioned and... Um, very genteel. I think you had to wear a skirt. You weren't allowed to wear trousers or something like that. <laughs> now would be completely bizarre. But um, and it was attached to the famous Con the Constance Price, um Cookery School as well. So there was uh, quite a lot going on there. So I did this um, uh, month certificate course, and I just sort of loved it. But it wasn't commercial. It was very much it. Wa it wasn't really flower arranging because she worked commercially but it wasn't sort of the nitty gritty of the flower business. So I decided that I would try and get a job um, teaching part of the week and working in a flower shop, um, which I did in the West End of London. So then I sort of learned um, more like an apprentice. And I also um, took another course, which is um, like a sitting guilds here, they call it, it would now be called something different. But so I did some other practical courses um, and I just really, um, I mean, it's so different then, but I, you know, I just, I had my nose against every flower shop. I read every, everything I could. Um, I just found something that I felt so, um, sort of passionate about really. Um, and so after two years, I just met my husband and I, um, decided to take the, the leap of faith and open a flower shop. Um, which obviously is um, was then looking back, um, it was it was that was quite a radical thing to do then. But obviously now that would be even more radical because shopping has had such a revolution. But um, so I I took this shop because teachers earned about fifty pounds a day, and I thought, well, I must be able to earn fifty pounds a day, um, you know, work, you know, running my own business. But of course, flowers is a very difficult business because you can earn 50 pounds a day one day and lose 50 pounds the next day, can't you? Or you can throw 500 pounds worth of flowers away. So um, it, it was a difficult um, 
I, I, you know, in hindsight, I probably would have preferred to have learned for a bit longer from someone else before starting my own business. But um, starting my own business without the traditional um, path meant that it 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 took a very different turn. And so very quickly, I thought, wow, I'm onto something here because, you know, people were coming in from all over the place um, and talking about the shop. So it, it became very popular really, really quickly, which, you know, looking back now um, is quite amazing. But um, at that time, the floral industry hadn't really was in a bad place in, in this country. It hadn't really, you could go to Paris or you could go obviously to Amsterdam and see, or Switzerland or any of the European countries and see much better flower um, offerings. So that, that's quite curious really what happened there. But, um, and so literally within three years, I was meeting quite a lot of um, influential people getting quite nice commissions and started to write my first book, which is quite amazing now, looking back on it, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it all it all happened quite, I mean, I wouldn't, I can't say it wasn't a struggle. <laughs> it's running your own business is always a struggle, isn't it? And, um, you know, I did work very hard, um, but we did something that was slightly new and fresh and people sort of really responded to it. I always read that you revolutionized how flower design is made or how it was made back then. And then Paula Pry came and everything changed. How is that? Well, I don't think I did it single handedly. Um, I, I mean, um, there are other people involved in it and we were all, most of us just changed careers So I think it was that sort of freak thing of looking at another industry in a different way that had traditionally been very apprentice based. You know, you went in and you learned how to make it from the person that been. And it wasn't really creative, which sounds kind of like really crazy now. And I think it wasn't creative um, partly because of the FTD into Flora thing had meant that um before people had credit cards that people you know wanted to know that the thing they were going to make was going to look like this exactly and so um majority of florists were producing things um quite standard um and you know at, at, even later on in my life i went to um a one at 800 flowers when they had their big depot in near new york mm -hmm. and they showed me this Uh, their best-selling chrysanthemum cake, you know, which was like a very small, uh, you know, I can't even, I won't even go there, you know, and I thought, well, that that's not even joyous. It was just nothing, you know what I mean? It was lots of things that people were producing weren't even attractive. Um, so, and that sounds quite odd now because there's been such an explosion in the industry, but, um, you know, that was just the luck of being back there. But really, Jane Packer, um, who was another one of my contemporaries, she started, she, just, she was, and sadly, she passed away, but she, she went in at, at 16. So she was in the business when I went into the business. And I think, um, you know, she was also someone else that radi radically changed things. But where you could buy a Tide Bunch, um, in any in Europe, you, you weren't really offered Tide Bunches in, in the UK. So I definitely think I was very responsible for introducing that and influencing a lot of people to do it. I, it's not my invention, obviously, but, um, uh, and, but then there were another, there's a whole group of us that um, are um, sort of, have been working in floristry, shall we say, at least 30 years. Um, and in London, we were competing with each other with, for work. So it just kept raising the standard, really. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? And also, as we know now, you know, London is this amazingly uh, cosmopolitan um, country that the, the, the rich of the world are attracted to and often stay for large chunks of the year. And... Um, With that comes a lot of entertaining, a lot of parties, a lot of events, 
you know, whether it's Ascot or Wimbledon or Chelsea Flower Show. And so we're quite uniquely placed, I think, in London, uh, probably New York's the same, maybe LA, but, you know, for this sort of international nomadic, rich um, clientele that are very necessary to the flower industry and obviously are not here now because <laughs> 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 they've gone all home, back home. So London, I don't know how London's going to uh, re-emerge when we come out of lockdown, which really starts to happen on Monday. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I know. It feels like all your Christmases and, yeah, it, yes. I mean, because we've really been more or less in lockdown for a year, um, which I, I know most people have, but different countries have dealt with it very differently, haven't they? Well, yes. Wow, that's amazing. I Jane Packer actually is someone I also have a lot of books from and I read a lot about her. And, well, I would really like to know because I... Sometimes I've read that you guys were friends, right? Or is it my imagination? Or you were like, because I always say here in Mexico how florists used to compete a lot and we're, we would never recommend another florist. And from the interviews I've read or comments I've read, it was like, why can't we be like Paula Pryk and Jean Packer? <laughs> Oh. That they were co-workers and in a way respect each other, but I would really like well, to that, know your that's opinion. certainly true. Uh, we were we weren't I wouldn't describe ourselves as friends, but we would um, you know, we we got we got on well. Um we saw each other's strengths, I think. And um on at times um, we'd ask each other's advice, yes. Um so I didn't see myself in competition with her. Um, I didn't really, um, quite the strange thing is a lot of the people who started when I started, they just wanted to do events and parties. And I started as a retailer, um, ended up doing quite a lot of contract work. And I did do events as well, but that wasn't my sole, um, it, wasn't the, it wasn't even the biggest part of my business. Um, Jane obviously um, started a flower school before I did because she probably published her first book earlier. Uh, but, well, she had published it before I even started my uh, shop. So, and um, because of that, we got known quite uh, internationally quite quickly, and um, which is quite it's very intriguing now, isn't it? Because um, so we both got invited to Japan a lot. We both got invited to America. Um, And, you know, it, the, the emphasis changed, then it was Korea, now it's probably China or, you know, and, and Mexico and Brazil and everywhere else. But yes, but those were the key countries. Um, I don't, amongst my little group, we weren't, um, we would recommend other people. And um, before we had Instagram and Pinterest, um, mm. you know, if someone came to me with someone else's work and said, will you make this? I said, well, why, you know, why aren't you asking Shane Connolly or Simon Lysett or some of the other great florists um, or Paul Thomas, it could have been, a, there's a number of us, but, um, you know, so it was very different. And there was, I mean, it, it's just entirely different. Um, and also you had to, you know, you could hire PR companies and you could do a lot of work on your marketing and PR, but you used to only get, really going if you were recommended and I think now you know it can be real smoke and mirrors can't it I mean you people can go out there and say I'm a world famous florist on Instagram and do that enough times that they can you know become a world famous florist but um I don't think it was it wasn't it, you couldn't self-publicize yourself like that you had the glory yeah. had to come to you I think really yeah yes definitely I agree with you And what motivated you to start your flower school? Because it's... Mm -hmm. what, well, how... I did that because, um, because of the books. Um, everyone saw the books and wanted to come and, 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 and do flower school. And it fitted. I had the space and it fitted with what I was doing and the way the model went. I... Um, I sort of, I actually stopped teaching when everyone was doing it because I just thought, actually, this has just gone balmy. And there's too many classes really um, on offer everywhere. And uh, 
well, it's now it's all gone online as well, hasn't it? So I kind of, um, and also I, it was, it, by the time that I decided I didn't really want to teach so much, um, the world was already changing. Um, and it was quite interesting because I um, had a, a student that came to work with me and it's probably about 15 years ago. And she sent me her report quite, not recently, but about three years ago, because she was tidying up her house. And she said, I found this, I thought you might be interested on my report of what I wrote about you. And she ends up her report saying, you know, Paula's terribly busy, but she seems to have no interest in the internet at all. <laughs> Which was kind of true, actually. Um, I didn't really, as I didn't really see that whole thing coming through, and and didn't make what I could have done of that really if I'd wanted to. Um, so, um, and it's been, and and now I sort of, especially with the last year. I mean, the great thing about sort of coming down to the end and all the Trump, that the all things was happened to us recently, is that I now work more with flowers <laughs> and people more, which was obviously the other reason that I kind of got, um, didn't want to teach so much because I, you know, then you end up not, you're working with flowers, sure, but working away from the things that I'd started loving doing, you know, and the customer side of it and, you know, the weddings and things like that. So it's very, diff it's very, difficult isn't it uh, I mean I think the best flower businesses are when you've got someone who's talented and talent and and passionate and you've got someone that's really business minded and you put the two together um and that that makes the best combination really so do you still work in your flower shop are you still I don't have I haven't had flower shops since the last recession actually so um I mean originally I had um I famously say I've opened and closed nine flower shops and um, I had six flower shops and about 43 employees in retail um, when the last recession came and um, obviously that started to, you know, it just, there wasn't, it wasn't feasible anymore. So I got out of retail at that stage and I've just done events and contracts since. Okay. Um, we still do gift bouquets and things like that and stuff on you know, off our website and online. But um, so I don't actually physically have a shop anymore. Doesn't mean I don't think about having one. <laughs> okay, okay, wow. I do know a lot about, you know, what works and what doesn't work with flower businesses. And um, and, it, it, and position is very key as well, really. Um, and also in, in London, I don't know if it's the same in Mexico, but you know, everybody started, you know, there's flowers, flower stalls, supermarkets sell flowers, whole fields sell flowers. The, you know, market was quite, sat is, is quite saturated. And then suddenly, boom, in the last 10 years, we've had all these slick online uh, retailers that they could be selling chocolates or whatever, but they've got huge venture capitalist budgets and they can put flowers on the buses in London and things that, you know, Interflora never did or couldn't ever do. And, and so the market share has been, you know, dwindling um, a lot. Yeah. Okay, yes. What is something, what is one of the things you like the most about designing with flowers? Well, I suppose that most people would say, I mean, obviously it's, it's color. It's my, it, you know, it's my, I, I obviously color is like everything. Um, And um, it's interesting, one of my main clients I've worked with about 25 years is actually Chanel. But, you know, everything has to be white or green. And sometimes I'm allowed to work in pale pink. And it's kind of, I think it's quite ironic, actually, that, that you know, that um, someone that loves colour as much as I do uh, has done a lot of white commissions for them. But, you know, working with them is just a complete honour and, and, and that brand and, uh, you know, And I like, I do like the, the pastels as well, but I, it's the exciting thing is definitely um, color, color combinations. And secondly, it's got to be the fact that the palette's changing all the time. Um, it's coming and going, yeah. Um, and obviously, I mean, it, it's obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's such, it, it does generally bring joy, um, flowers. And um, it's, it's great working with the emotions as well. Yes, definitely. I have to agree with you. Do you have a favorite flower or some flowers that you like the most? 
Um, well, I, I mean, obviously, I like the English cottage garden flowers like sweet peas and uh, nigella and scabious and things like that, peonies, garden roses, um, and a lot of scented flowers like lily of the valley. Um, I, I, my all time favorite is definitely ranunculus, and you know, interestingly they've gone on to be get more beautiful every year because new varieties come out and then you've got the butterfly ranunculus and things like that. So they still pretty much do it for me. Um, and I mean, I sometimes get a bit frustrated by Instagram because <laughs> Instagram loves the flowers that change and die and at the later stage. Whereas when you're working as a commercial florist, um, most of the time you're, you're needing your flowers to last, you know, for, to give value to the customer or to, um, uh, you know, for a contract, for a hotel or something like that. So you need, you know, there are other things that you need to work with than poppies and um, dahlias, let's say. <laughs> mm. Definitely. When, obviously, um, since I started in the flower business, um, my, I, I went into the flower business because my mom had a flower shop. But I, I was more into the business side than the designing part. But I, my mom had your books, had two of your books or one of your books. I don't remember. But I remember I started reading them. And then I really liked your style. And eventually I started designing. And I have maybe five or six of your books. And I, I've always remember you were a huge influence in in how I design, but in preparing for this interview, I got them out again and I was reading them. And when I was reading them, it was so amazing that it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I think like this because of her or how you connect with flowers, how you respect flowers, how you know that when we sell a flower arrangement is because we're trying to send a message and we have to decide which flowers. And it was like, no wonder, <laughs> no wonder I think like this. So could you tell us more about that? I mean, how when, when you were in your shop and people would come in and ask you for flowers or stuff like that, the selling process and the creative process. Well, that's an interesting one. I mean, I suppose, I, you know, I can't deny that um, I was lucky to be able to do the books because it gives you the freedom to work without the client. But then, obviously, the client comes in and says, I like this and I want 35 of them or whatever, or, or you move designs on in a certain way. Um, so... Um, you know I think you know definitely being having that freedom to just have a five days in the studio making flowers without clients does help but I I think also clients um it's about getting into clients personalities if you're doing their wedding or if you're doing an event with them isn't it and and creating something with them um not um just presenting an idea which is why um latterly um I mean, I, I, have a, I have some lovely friends who are wedding planners and things, but and event planners, but as the jobs got sort of more tiers of people helping you organize them, it got harder to get to the bottom of what the bride and groom might want because they might be too busy to talk to you or the wedding planner is going to tell you. Or, and so I found that I, I, that's another bit about the business that I, didn't, I don't like so much because I really do like if I'm doing someone's wedding to, you know, get to know them. Um, um, obviously sometimes that hasn't happened now because they both overseas are coming to London to get married you don't meet them till the day but you know particularly if they're around it's nice to get a feel for people and um, put something together that way um, but I, um, I think you know I've always with colour I've always thought oh I'd like to try that combination with that so that's something that just constantly is in, in the back of my head I suppose <laughs> How do you think it was for your daughters to be Paula Pryke's daughters? Well, I think they don't want to be do floristry, but so it's interesting you followed your mum into it. And I, I, I don't know if you know the English florist um, Zita Else. Do you know her work? No. She's got a flower shop in Kew. 
And I see her daughter's just joined her and I'm dying to bump into her and find out how that is because Zita's a very clever designer. And um, so that must be quite interesting. But um, I mean, uh, it, it still could happen. <laughs> 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 it is difficult they do say well i don't i don't think i'd ever be as good so they're not sort of like um yeah and they've also worked out it's quite hard work <laughs> yes definitely yeah definitely. You know, on those days when i have taken them to work so mm. yeah but maybe the difference is um my mom opened her flower shop when i was 15 so it wasn't when I was a, a, a child. And for example, my kids don't like it that I'm a florist. <laughs> my daughter is always like, when are you going to get a normal job, mom? <laughs> uh, really? Yes. When she was little, she used to like me doing flowers and she would come with me. But now that she's a teenager, she's always like, your job takes a lot of time <laughs> and yeah. stuff like that. Well, yeah. my husband's probably a bit the same. <laughs> he wouldn't have encouraged my daughters to do it. Only because it does, I mean, it, it takes you away, if, if you, particularly if you're in retail, it, it takes you away, doesn't it? And, you, you know, back to that thing about, you know, two weddings on the same day, but you know your clients are going to ask you to do something on the same day and it's, you're going to be... <laughs> It's going to be complicated. It's going to bound to be your daughter's birthday back to your earlier. Yeah, isn't it? So, I, I mean, I do, I have had people work for me. Um, and, you know, you, it, you, it's a vocation almost because it's just a total dedication to the, the, the flowers, isn't it? It's um, uh, um, actually, um, I used to have someone that ran, I used to have a branch of flowers at Liberty's, the, the department store in London. And the manager there used to say, it's like the girls that want to ride horses and ponies, but they don't want to muck out. You know, you've got to do both in floristry, haven't you? And you've got to do, you know, that the, the shoveling of the um, flowers, etc. It's always so much work involved in it, isn't there? So, and then often taking it out. And, and also when you do events, it's very complicated. The time that you take, you know, it goes in and then the time it all comes out and, you know, dealing with that, the, the waste of it, etc. Um, there's a lot more to it than people see, isn't there, really? Or perceive, yeah. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. You have been in the flower industry for more than 30 years. How, how do you see florists back then compared to florists right now, to young modern florists? Mm. Well there's a lot to be said by that I mean the market is quite flooded there's no doubt about it um I guess back then we more we generally had you know if we didn't have shops we had you know studios and overheads and um nowadays people can sort of almost operate out of the back of a van uh, with their mm -hmm. mobile phone so it's quite different um, I mean, in the, in the Sunday Times last weekend, it said everyone's lockdown hustle is making hand, hand, homemade bouquets. And I thought, it's not far from the truth, actually. <laughs> and, and, and basically, they're saying everyone's now a flower farmer. Well, I'm, I think everyone is, has enjoyed working with their hands, doing flowers, doing more practical things, haven't they? Gardening more, if they've got a garden. Um, whether we'll all just go mad when we can get out and get out back and it will be more like the roaring 20s that they're expecting than us all gardening, um, I don't know. It, I mean, it could go either way, couldn't it? Um, I just know from my, from my own experience of, of growing just a few flowers, I've never tried to grow for, um, you know, for production, let's put it that way, is that, you know, life gets in the way, <laughs> you know, you go on holiday or you get an event, it's died or something like that. So it's very hard work to grow and um, be a, a flower ranger. I can't think of any, you know, as you said, floristry is quite uh, demanding. Putting growing with it is like, like, <laughs> why would you? <laughs> it just would mean it would be terribly difficult, I think. And I think also then the other thing that worries me about the the growing aspect of it 
is it does mean that people probably don't put a proper value on things. Um, you know, because we even have that here in the UK, we grow quite a lot of daffodils. And the man that grows the most um, says that the supermarkets still want him to produce it, to sell it at a pound a bunch, which um, they've been doing for 20 years, 30 years, uh, maybe longer, you know, which, and you know that it can't be, can't work for him now to still produce that for that price. And if you buy Narcissi from the Dutch auction, they're like £4.50 a bunch because they don't treat that flower any differently to anything else. It's got its market value, hasn't it, in Holland from the auction. And you think that just goes to show. I mean, I don't know why our grower doesn't send his Narcissi to Holland. He probably can't do that now. But, um, yeah, so um, I think that's a, that's a worrying thing. And I think it that's another not great thing about our industry. It's quite it's quite hard sometimes to charge a lot of money for something. Um, and the expectation is sometimes it shouldn't be um, as expensive as it is. And we're certainly going through a phase now coming out of lockdown and Brexit where, you know, I'm saying, well, you know, we need to significantly put prices up and people are going to be quite surprised about that or it's simply not worth making. Um, so I don't know, there's a lot of different factors um, emerging, isn't there? And then there's always new people coming into the business that will work for nothing to get their market share. And so that, that's, I think that worldwide, that's an issue, isn't it? Wow, I would never have thought that would, that happens in England. I would never thought people work for free like they do in Mexico and Latin America. Wow. Yes. Well, some people don't need to work, you know, some people are lucky enough not to need to work, they've got other partners, but they want that job. Um, and some, some people think that, that they can buy their work that way. Um, but I don't think you can in the long term, I don't think that works. Yeah. So I, I don't remember having these, um, these disruptors to the industry when I started um, 30 years ago, I don't really remember that this 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 disrupting the market is a, a sort of last 10 year policy. And it's either the venture capitalists buying flower shops and flower schools, which is happening quite a lot here at the moment, or, um, you know, it's people that don't need their partner is the breadwinner and they're sort of wanting to get into an industry. Yeah. So do you have a studio you work in? Uh... I have a studio in, in London, near, not far, just near the Thames, near Houses of Parliament, actually, on the south side of the river, which is where we work. And then I have all my, my collections that I've had from years and years and years. I, that's, I live out of town near Cambridge, and I have that uh, stored in barns in the country, um, the, the, you know, which are, the principally they've been there all the time because it's too expensive to keep everything in, in London. So I bring them in and out for events. But um, yeah, it has been quite weird having all this stuff and then not using any of it as well for like so long. Yeah. Um, vases and candelabras and yeah, pedestals and urns and things. Yeah. So it'd be nice to get some of those back out again. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> I love it more every time I listen to it. And I'm like more delighted to, to have had this opportunity to talk with you and for you to share with us your experience. 